So we're going to talk a little bit about rethinking the management that you use in order to regenerate soil systems. Okay. Uh, soil health is the capacity of the soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. The key words here are continued capacity and things like living ecosystem. Okay. Continued capacity means that it's about rejuvenation of the soil, okay? being able to support what you have out there. Living ecosystem means that it's a biological, ecological living system. Okay? There's biology involved here. We have to pay attention to that. The other key word is function, and particularly soil function. When we talk about soil function, we're referring to the ecosystem processes that are in the soil. Those ecosystem processes, in fact, 90% of all soil function is mediated by the biology in the soil. It's what creates a carbon cycle. It's what creates the plants convert solar energy into chemical energy. That chemical energy is fed to the biology in the soil. Okay? Plants have this symbolic relationship with biology. You create a good biocommunity cycle, that includes the soil food web, the bacteria, the fungi, the protozoa, the nematodes that feed on them. And then, of course, you've got all your different types of plants. The plants that you all grow uh, primarily work a lot with row crop farmers, like Mr. Jimmy Emmons over here. And uh, you raise what? Grain sorghum, maybe some corn, all these different things. Those are actually later successional plants. Okay. They come from a certain ecological successional stage, and we're going to talk about that. Okay? If you get a good functioning biocommunity cycle, biology, plants, animals integrated into your system, you're going to get a good water cycle. You start to see those infiltration rates go up. Right, Jimmy? I've been out to uh, his farm, and we've actually done infiltration. We've seen this happen. There are certain things that you can use to guide yourself to know that you're headed in the right direction. And then if you get a good water cycle, then you're going to have a good nutrient cycle occur. Okay? That's all created by the biology. Even the nutrient cycle itself comes from the fact that the protozoa eat the bacteria, or fungal feeding nematodes feed on bacteria. That's where you get mineralization. We'll discuss that. So there's been a changing vision of soil. The concept of fixed soil properties has been shattered by <clears throat> soil health farmers and ranchers. And they've changed how they envision or how they look at soil health and function of their soil. Key here is, is that what they're doing is, is that the operation and management decisions are, that are made enhance those ecosystem processes. So everything they do on the farm, they have this in the back of their mind, what is it going to do to enhance the carbon cycle? What is it going to do to build more organic matter? What's it going to do to change the nutrient cycle? Okay. They understand that the soil is a living factory. And they know that management activities determine that level of soil health and function of the soil. Now, I've been doing this for quite a while as an agronomist, as an entomologist, as a soil health specialist. And I can tell you that I run into two systems for growing plants. Okay. One is an inorganic synthetic system, chemical paradigm, that's conventional agriculture. And this leads to a dysfunctional, unhealthy soil. It leads to that soil that you see in that photograph right there. It lacks structure, lacks retention of water and nutrients. Uh, it's compacted. Uh, it's anaerobic. Okay. It lacks the proper soil microbe habitat specific to plants you're growing. Okay. So whenever you do tillage, understand that soil that you see up there at the top, it doesn't have any mycorrhizal fungi in it. It doesn't have a lot of the associative bacteria that you need to have in your system for the plants that you're trying to grow. The soil that follows an organic biological ecological paradigm is a functioning soil. It has the aggregate structure that you need to have to support the complexity of microorganisms. It has good air and water passage. It has nutrient retention and cycling occurring. 
within it. It has proper soil microbe habitat. It has the proper fungi to bacteria ratio. We're going to discuss that. So you're essentially you're transitioning your soil system from a dysfunctional system to a functional system. Now, would you believe that the soils that you see here are the same soil type? Does that look like that? That's actually the same soil type. What's the common denominator in that photo of that slide right there? Anybody know? Why does one look so much different than the other? It's called management. It's how you have managed that soil. We manage soil to do this, or we can manage soil to do this over here. Okay? So we just have to understand how to get there. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about, is I want to get that good functioning soil. I want to be able to build organic matter content. Okay? So one of the things we have to understand in order to get there, we have to understand that the soil food web is complex. When you have that tilled soil, like you see over there on the left, it only has bacteria in it. There's really no fungal association. Okay? And so what happens in that system is that you're actually functioning. You're actually functioning right here. You don't have all these other microorganisms really in that system. You're lacking all of that. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to get more complexity. We want to allow the habitat to occur uh, within that system. And we want to attain what are called spheres of influence. Spheres of influence are simply, we're trying to get a detritus sphere, a porous sphere, a drill sphere. These are all areas or areas of influence resulting from biological activities in the soil. Okay? You notice on the dysfunctional soil, you didn't have any of these spheres there. They're gone because of our management of them. Okay. So what we have to think of is that these are ecological systems. And ecological systems, they gain ecological successional stages over time. In other words, if you were to go and remove all the vegetation off the land, if we were to do brush management, Dr. T, what would you see come back on that field or that rain spot in time? You start out with what, annual plants? biennials, perennials, shrubs, if you were not to do anything. That's why we had yesterday, you had uh, Jeff talk about trying to establish native grasses. Very difficult to do when you put that system in the first stage of ecological succession. Okay? Because what happens in that situation is, is that it's bacterially dominated. It does not fit the plants that you're trying to grow. Okay? As the system gets more complex, the bacteria start to grow. You start to see the amounts of bacteria go up. You also see the amounts of fungi start to go up. It's critical to understand that because now we're starting to get the mycorrhizal fungi, we're starting to get the uh, free-fixing nitrogen bacteria, the phosphorus solubilizing bacteria that associate with them. And we start building the system that supports your types of plants that you're trying to grow, which is somewhere right in here when you get balance. The other thing that happens that I want to bring to your attention is the uh, nitrogen. In bacterially dominated systems, the predominant form of nitrogen is nitrate. And that's because you have decomposing bacteria and you also have nitrifying bacteria. So when a protozoa eats a bacteria, and it excretes ammonium, that ammonium is immediately transformed into nitrate. That's why in tilled agricultural systems, you get a lot of nitrate there as your form of nitrogen. That's not really a good thing for your types of plants that you're trying to grow. Okay? Nitrogen is not very water efficient, because nitrogen has to be uh, taken up by the plant, has to be translocated to the leaf, and then water is lost through transpiration then that nitrate has to be converted into a uh, amine or amino acid. When it does that, it also requires micronutrients. So what's happening when you saw that soil uh, sample earlier of that 
dysfunctional soil. See how light colored it was? Doesn't have a lot of organic matter. Lacking a lot of those micronutrients so that the metabolic function can convert something like nitrate into an amino acid. Okay. We're going to go into a little bit more deep discussion of that. So anyway, when you start adding fungi into the system, when you get that ammonium produced, you don't get the ammonium being converted into nitrate. Because mycorrhizal fungi especially, they put out organic acids into the soil. Okay. And they lower the pH. When they lower the pH, the nitrifying bacteria don't function. So ammonium stays as ammonium. Now the other thing about the predatory organisms that feed on bacteria and fungi is that when they feed on bacteria and fungi, they don't just excrete inorganic nutrients. They don't just excrete ammonium. About 50% is excreted as a, what we call a microbial metabolite. That's actually a chelated form of nutrient. And those things can be used by, by plants. We're just not able to measure those things right now because they're organic. You know, when you get a uh, soils test back, you're testing for inorganic nutrients. You're not looking for organic. Okay. This is one of the reasons that we want to use other testing methods like the uh, Haney test as an example, just to kind of get an idea of maybe what's there. So when you look at these ecological systems, understand what your plants need. The plants that you're trying to grow come from late successional grass row crop stage. That's right in here, okay? That means they have to have a ratio of fungi to bacteria of one to one, okay? So that means that they're gonna have mycorrhizal fungi, they're gonna have the solubilizing types of bacteria associated with them, they're gonna have the prefixing nitrogen bacteria, you're gonna build this up to that complex level, okay? And this is the soil food web uh, structure to succession. You see that there's increasing productivity from here to here. The problem that we have uh, in these soil systems is that we always, we don't tend to pay attention to this plant successional ladder. And what happens, <coughs> excuse me, what happens is that we're right here in most of our agricultural system. This is from Dr. Uh, David Johnson, and it's off the uh, Elaine Ingham Soil Food website. We're right here in agricultural systems most of the time, okay? So really our system is supporting weeds. Very high nitrate, it's compacted. We wanna be up here at a one-to-one -one ratio. We wanna support the late successional types of plants, the row crops and things that we're growing. In fact, cotton actually has an even higher fungi to bacteria ratio. It's up here at two, point, uh, two to one to five to one. It'll grow into a tree if you'll let it. And I know that for a fact because down the Rio Grande Valley, along the river, we have a cotton plant tree that we all go and look at every year to remind us entomologists about how bad bow weevils are. Okay, but uh, you need to understand that you need to have the proper fungi to bacteria ratio, and understand that uh, impacts of disturbances. See, when we manage these things, soil re regeneration involves controlled disturbance keeping it, maintaining it where we want to have it. And that's what people like Dr. Teague are doing with adaptive grazing management, is that they're able to use grazing as a form of disturbance to maintain that grassland successional state, okay? On cropland and things, we can use tillage slightly, we can use some of these things, but use them sparingly in order to make sure that we don't take it back to where it's uh, a, is a habitat for weeds, okay? For I know there's a lot of some NRCS people here, and even for farmers, it's important to understand your plant successional stage, plants you're trying to grow, and also understand what your biological successional stage is in the soil, okay? Uh, you have to really grasp an understanding of that because if you're in a bacterially dominated system, and you're trying to grow things like grain sorghum or corn or soybean, I can promise you that weeds are gonna outcompete that crop. Just like they do when we have native range planting in a till situation. 
it's hard to establish those types of plants because they don't come from that particular biological succession thing. You just have to recognize that. So we understand that monocultures and monomanagement invites invasive species and it invites biological imbalances that we don't want to have in that system. We want to build it. I had a training out in New Mexico this past year and uh, what do you see in that slide right there? Is that a healthy condition? I saw acres and acres of this from Brownfield over to New Mexico where you had cotton growing and the weeds were healthier than the crop, than the cotton, okay? That's what I noticed. I'm sure the farmer didn't think that way. He was probably cussing that he had all the weed pressure, everything that was there. But when you keep that field in that stage of ecological succession, that's what's going to happen, okay? You're going to get those weeds. And there's ways to detect some of these things. We're going to talk here later about uh, a uh, uh, BRICS uh, refractometer, how to measure some of the things in, uh, in order to tell you what's going on uh, in these particular systems. Most of the time when we think of trying to build organic matter, we have this perception, and I know I did for many years, is that we use a typical biomass model. We think that when we build organic matter, it's the amount of biomass that's produced above ground that leads to the organic matter in the soil. That's not really the case. In fact, when carbon enters the soil system as plant stubble, it decomposes and it returns to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide immediately. Most of the time, we burn more organic matter out of the soil than what we return in biomass. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rakowski has a lot of information on that. I didn't put a slide in here to illustrate that because it's because of time. But just know that that happens. That's what happens with a typical biomass uh, model. So what we want to do is we want to minimize disturbance. We want to maximize cover. We want to maximize biodiversity provide continuous living roots, and for many of you, the option of livestock integration is possible. Livestock integration enhances the biogeochemical cycling process in that system. Okay, so if you can do that and integrate livestock, that'll be a good thing. So what we're gonna do with our agricultural management, and as far as practices are concerned, we wanna choose practices that promote soil health and feed soil organisms and protect their habitat. That habitat is a soil aggregate. We have to have an aggregated soil in order to maintain things like mycorrhizal fungi, prefixing bacteria, solubilizing bacteria, especially prefixing bacteria. <coughs> they are not like rhizobium bacteria that form nodules on the, on the uh, root. And so what happens in that situation is they're prefixing. But in order to fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere, you have to be very limited on the amount of oxygen that's there or the nitrogenase enzyme does not work. They can't fix it. Okay. So what they do is they grow in population. And then they have this association with mycorrhizal fungi that feed them carbon. That's their food source. They're not decomposers. So what happens, they have to have this aggregated soil in order to grow in population to limit the amount of oxygen inside the colony. When they do that, they can fix nitrogen. Okay. We have this on a lot of our grasslands, this association. I ran into this uh, along the Gulf Coast. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, of uh, bahia grass. Bahia grass has an association with the zotobacter. And the zotobacter is where we actually got the uh, medical sutures and stuff because they produce what are called poly. And I, this was a real long one, and I have to have to laugh here, Jimmy, because I had to teach Ray Archuleta this particular word, and that was polyhydroxyalkanoate. So it's just a fancy word for a carbon chain and the ability of Zotobacter to build carbon. They actually store carbon until they build enough of a population that they can start fixing the nitrogen to go with it. But those polyhydroxyalkanoate are where we get the medical sutures that automatically uh, decompose or break down that we use, okay? It's actually an organic or type of biological polymer.
So what we want to focus on are the management dependent properties of the soil. At the top of the list there, you see uh, organic matter content. So that's what we want to do. We want to build true organic matter in the soil, not active organic matter by tilling it in the soil and then it's becoming very available very quickly. We want to go through the mycorrhizal fungi. We want to feed the phosphorus solubilizing bacteria. We want to feed the nitrogen, prefixing nitrogen bacteria in the soil. Okay? So we want to focus on organic matter. We get organic matter through the biology. In order to get organic matter, you have to go through the eye of the needle, okay, which are the microorganisms, in order to get that organic matter into the soil system. More particularly, we want to sequester carbon. And the way that we do that in the po opposition to the biomass model that I described to you is that the uh, mycorrhizal carbon pathway, which is known as the liquid carbon pathway by Dr. Christine Jones, means that carbon enters the soil through the mycorrhizal fungi. And then to all the other associative types of bio biology in the soil. And I don't remember if in Dr. Teague's uh, slide, if you had a, uh, a picture of where you did proper grazing management and you saw the color of the soil get darker, deeper down into the soil. That's what's happening when we do this, okay? It happens on cropland and stuff also. So the first thing we have to pay attention to is photosynthesis, okay? And understand that photosynthesis, uh, when we have get photosynthesis in the soil, it has to do with chlorophyll. Anytime you see a green plant out there, particularly in a range condition, you don't have any legumes around, where the heck does the nitrogen come from in order for that plant to be green like that and form chlorophyll? It comes from the associative types of bacteria like prefixing nitrogen bacteria. So just know and understand that plants have this association. We've kind of eliminated that from our vocabulary uh, over the past so many years. Okay. Uh, other thing to understand as we do this, I'm going to show you a video here to prove to you that root exits actually go into the soil system. This is Ray Archuleta. Do you have the volume? I can't hear very well today. But you'll hear his son or grandson telling him that he's making mud. Okay. I was laughing. That's the only thing I got out of this video. I was sitting there listening to that, and I heard his son mention that, or his grandson mention it there in the background that he was wanting to know why he was making mud. But what he's showing you there is, on the left, you have a corn root ball. It's dead. And on the right, you have triticale, vetch, and some other uh, plants uh, that are living, and they're putting those polysaccharides or that carbon into the soil. Okay? You'll see it float to the top. I used to see this a lot because I used to work with irrigation systems in the winter garden area of Texas. And we used to dig a lot of pipelines across pastures and stuff. And whenever you would refill those pipelines, you'd see all this scum floating up to the top. I didn't know what that was at that time. I didn't realize that those are actually root exits. Okay? So they're actually feeding the biology. And you know, whenever roots grow in the ground, uh, they'll typically start to spew out these root exits that see there. I wasn't able to get the uh, vi actual video clip of this, but as they grow, you'll see the amount of root exits start to come out of that particular plant. You know, when roots grow in the ground, uh, they have to come in contact with things like calcium. If there's no calcium there, that root will not grow in that direction. Okay. Those are some other things to know. Is that I don't have the time to go into that in detail. But just know that we're going to focus on bacteria and fungi and know that bacteria and fungi release enzymes that act to convert organic molecules you know, from the residues into soluble types of nutrients. That's commonly what we focus on. And we focus on soil protozoa, springtails, nematodes, mites, consuming the bacteria and fungi, and then they mineralize the nutrients that we need to have. Okay. 
And so that right there is a simple process of mineralization. However, fungi are way different. Mycorrhizal fungi, you heard it mentioned yesterday. I think Nathan mentioned it, and maybe Keith mentioned it. Uh, they talk about fungi decomposing the hard to decompose materials in the soil. Okay? And because they do this, there is a way to enhance the amount of biomass that you produce above ground so that it produces more humic substances. The way that you do that is that you focus on the amount of phospholipids that are being produced by the plant. Healthy plants that are able, that are nutritionally sound, will produce more lipid content. Okay, and the reason that's important, because if you have 10,000 pounds that has a 2% lipid content, and you have 10,000 pounds that have a 6% lipid content, the 6% lipid content would give you three times the amount of total organic matter or humic substances in that soil. Because when fungi break down those materials, they break them down to a 40% lipid content. And when they do that, you get a humic substance. It's not going to be broken down anymore. So the more lipids you have in the soil system, or in the biomass, excuse me, then you're going to have more of this humic substance produced. Now, the reason that I mention the, the humic substances uh, in these situations is because we have to understand that biology is what helps us maintain the aggregate stability. It helps us regenerate the soil biologically. It's balanced. It's diverse. It works with these different functional groups of uh, bacteria and fungi, and they help us build disease and pest defense. The colonizing fungi, like I mentioned earlier, and aerobic microorganisms, the prefixing nitrogen bacteria, particularly in fossil bacteria, build soil structure and cycle nutrients for you. Okay, so you have to have this form of biology. Mycorrhizae, I can't stress how important they are in your system. They assist with plant uptake. They move nitrogen around. You know, that's one of the other uh, keys about these. We found this out a few years ago. Uh, they discovered that uh, mycorrhizal fungi, uh, the hyphae, are actually able to pick up amino acids. Really, up until that time, I was always taught that the only two forms of nitrogen in the soil were nitrate and ammonium. That's it. That's not true. Plants have the ability to source organic nitrogen by picking up amino acids because of their association with mycorrhizal fungi. And that's very critical for you guys that are growing row crops because those crops are mycorrhizal, maybe everything except for maybe canola, okay? But all the other crops that you have, they're mycorrhizal plants. You need to get those associations in there. They also help you with the pickup of, uh, or extensions to absorb uh, phosphorus in the soil. As roots grow through the ground, what they do is they deplete the amount of phosphorus around the root zone. So you get this depletion of phosphorus. Mycorrhizae are able to get beyond that, are able to get beyond that, and they're able to access phosphorus and other nutrients beyond that depletion zone. That's why they're so important to plants. That's why you see them go through stress much better compared to non-mycorrhizal plants because okay, they have this symbiotic relationship. They also have the ability to form bridges across pore spaces. So when your soils dry up and you lose that capillary water action, they're able to bridge those and pull immobile nutrients and things like that from adjoining aggregates. Take them all the way back to the plant. Okay. They also assist us with water management. Some mycorrhizal fungi form uh, these storage containers called vesicles. Not all of them do, but a good number of them do. They store water and nutrients. This is another reason that mycorrhizal plants go through stress better. Okay? So when moisture becomes limiting during a dry period, the mycorrhizal plant utilizes the water that's stored in the root cell vesicle. Okay? That's very key to us, to our guys that are working in arid areas. Okay, of Texas and Oklahoma. Also understand <clears throat> that the mycorrhizal fungi is uh, the hyphae are like 125th the size of a hair. 
They're super, super, super small. So as you start regenerating these soils, you have to have things like mycorrhizal fungi because they're the only things, those hyphae are the only things that can get into all those little nooks and crannies. When they do that, they're able to pull calcium off the cation exchange site of that, those clay particles. Okay? They actually pull clay when you have some, or calcium, excuse me, when you have calcium in the soil, calcium actually disperses the soil. Magnesium actually tightens it. You know, as an agronomist, we all know we're taught that we're supposed to have calcium and magnesium in a ratio of like five or seven to one. If you have that ratio, you have a good aerobic soil condition. But if those ratios get out of whack, and you start having less calcium compared to magnesium, magnesium actually tightens the soil up. So you gotta be aware of that. As soon as you start tilling the soil, you change the calcium and the magnesium levels immediately. So we need to understand that. Okay. Uh, also, those mycorrhizal hyphae, <clears throat> when they receive carbon from the plant, their source of nitrogen that they add to it in order to form glomalin, which is, is a, that's a glycoprotein, by the way. It's a glycoprotein is actually a lipid, that's a fat. So when they do that, they source their nitrogen not from the plant, they source the nitrogen from the prefixing nitrogen bacteria. If they source it from the plant, they would be stressing the plant. The plant makes plenty of photosynthase, but it can't make nitrogen. That has to come from the uh, biology of the soil. So you get all these extensive hyphae that are able to get into the areas that roots cannot access. And you have to understand that mycorrhizal fungi digestion is humification. Organisms consume other organisms. They have these associations with prefixing nitrogen bacteria, phosphorus solubilizing bacteria. They also <coughs> tend to fungi because they decompose things over and over. It's not really the decomposition process. What they're actually doing is they're building up the humic molecules that are in the soil, along with the phosphorus solubilizing, all the other types of bacteria that solubilize nutrients. And what they end up doing, they form these humic substances in the soil. That's true organic matter. Okay? And so that's what I wanted to focus on is to, uh, to mention how this process works. Uh, plants photosynthesize. They uh, turn sucrose, which is simple sugar, into hexose before they feed it to a mycorrhizal fungi. And when they feed it to mycorrhizal fungi, it immediately turns it into a glycoprotein, which is a lipid. And it coats its hyphae with that. Okay, so that it doesn't leak nutrients back. Okay, because it's carrying water, nutrients, stuff like that. And that particular glycoprotein, that's what is called glomalin. That word was mentioned yesterday. That's what glomalin is. Okay, glomalin is very resistant to decomposition in the soil. And the only thing that can break it down, like I told you earlier, are the fungi. So once you get that carbon in there in that form, you're going to sequester more carbon in the soil. That's true organic matter, okay? We want less carbon in the air, more carbon down in the soil, and understand the importance of humic substances. Uh, this came to my attention <coughs> when I did my first talk in Chillicothe. I happened to have an old professor that was there that I didn't even recognize because I hadn't seen him in 20 years. His name is Dr. Robert Pettit. For some reason, he was at that training. And one of the papers that he put out was about what humic substances were, explaining their importance to, to biology, to soil health. And so I became intrigued by learning about humic substances. Humic substances are very important because when you form these humic uh, things like humic acids and slovic acids, what I'll focus on, they have carboxyl and hydroxyl groups, okay? That's that carbon with oxygen and oxygen and, and then hydrogen, and then you have a carbon, oxygen, and a hydrogen. But what happens is that those carboxyl groups and hydroxyl groups occur in pairs, and they drop off. When they drop off that hydrogen, you get a negative two charges that are negative there. Okay? Now if you just think about this a little bit, all the micronutrients and things that are in your system, they're positively charged. 
manganese, copper, iron, molybdenum, and even your secondary types of things like calcium and magnesium. So how do we hold those particular nutrients in the soil? We have to have organic matter. We have to have these humic substances or you're not going to be able to retain those. And humic substances, when you look at humic substances, <clears throat> they're primarily used for the metabolic processes in the plant. Okay? They're not really part of the structure. They're so that the met metabolic processes, like the, the enzymes that you use to convert, let's say, uh, uh, nitrate into an amino acid or an amino acid into a protein, they have to have, more than likely, they have to have some sort of micronutrient because that's a cofactor for that enzyme to function, for those processes to happen. So this is how the soil forms all this and it holds it. It's helping you, okay, to perform those metabolic processes. You don't have any organic matter, you're gonna start running into problems trying to get your plants to function, to grow, okay? And I uh, mentioned to you earlier, remember I mentioned about microbial metabolites. This is the pool of nutrients and stuff that we don't really have a handle on. But we know now, after I showed you about how mycorrhizal fungi help you pick up organic forms of nitrogen, like amino acids and stuff like that, we know now that chelated forms of nutrients can be picked up by plants. We just don't know how to measure it quite just yet. Okay? Haney test is the one that's coming closest to that. But with biology, chelation can happen as part of the organism's digestive process. You add microbes and plant nutrition, and it's no longer ruled by pH alone. And uh, it's chelated. Okay. So soil is habitat for the microorganisms. This is from Dr. Rick Haney. This is what 2% organic matter has in it. Okay. You've got something like 2,000 pounds of soil Four thousand pounds of organic nitrogen and two thousand pounds of organic phosphorus. Okay, biology is what makes that come available to you. There is no other way to get to that other than going through the uh, the biology that's in the soil system. Okay, this is just another illustration. Uh, Dr. Haney will send this out to you all the time. He'll tell you what. Uh, the amount of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and sulfur are in your soil. They're available to you, but they may not be plant available to you because you don't have enough biology in your soil. Okay. Um, so when you think of nutrient pool, just understand there's a whole lot of nutrients out there that, that we have really don't have an understanding about and what we work with in organic and uh, conventional systems it's just this small little pool of soluble nutrients. There's so much more extractable, so much more total nitrogen in that system, and we have to use biology to access it. Okay. Fertilizer impact. I know this question came up yesterday. Whenever you use high amounts of phosphorus fertilizer, okay, what it does to a plant is that it inhibits strigolactone production. That's a growth hormone, root growth hormone specifically. This is from Dr. Christine Jones. You see the plant on the right. They used 100 pounds. I think it was uh, kilograms per hectare of DAP, diammonium phosphate. Over here, this was pasture crop. They didn't use any inorganic fertilizer. Look at the differences in the soil structure and the root structure whole whole lot of difference there because one plant's able to associate with the biology the other plant is, is inhibited from associating with it so once the phosphorus runs out around the root that's it for the one that doesn't have those mycorrhizal associations and the bacterial associations and I might add that the uh, diammonium phosphate monoammonium phosphate those things also have nitrogen in them anytime you have high rates of nitrogen in the system then you inhibit the prefixing nitrogen bacteria that are in that system. 
because those plants will not put the root exudates out like they're supposed to. They think it's already there, so why expend the energy? Okay. This is the plant health pyramid. I was going to discuss this because the degree of plant health and immunity is based on plants' ability to form structurally complete compounds. Okay. When plants grow, they produce carbohydrates, then they produce protein, then they produce fats, lipids, and oils, and then they, prevent, uh, they uh, grow uh, plant secondary metabolites. Okay. You have to get all these building blocks in place before you can uh, make the more complex compounds. Okay, so we start with the production of complete carbohydrates. That means that you get the production of this complete carbohydrate. You get, uh, uh, we'll go into the resistances here in just a second. But the main point here is, is that you've got to keep your plant in a protein synthesis mode. Trophobiosis has its foundation in the premise that insect and disease pests cannot utilize complete proteins and carbohydrates as a food source. Some of my background is I'm an entomologist. Giving you that statement right there is telling you that in your plant system, your insects attack plants at certain stages of growth. The reason they attack those plants at certain stages of growth is because of the amount or the ability or energy level that is in that plant. Okay? Here's why that's important. When plants produce have successful photosynthesis, they put the root exudates into the soil, they build the bacteria around the root, you get resistance to fusarium, rhizoctonia, verticillium, which are root pathogens, okay? Because you're getting the bacteria to grow next to the root instead of allowing the pathogenic types of fungi to attack it, okay? Those bacteria extract nutrients. They pull the micronutrients that's in the organic matter and then what they do, they feed that to the plant so that it can produce protein. It's enzymatic, it's biological function occurs, okay? So once plants produce uh, complete protein, then you have increased resistance to insects that have simple digestive systems. What I mean by that is, is you'll have resistance to aphids, white flies, and larval insects. I learned about this many, many years ago when I was using those llamas uh, for a uh, national seed company. Is that they always told us when we plant grain sorghum, and this is something for Jimmy Emmons, they always told us that in our demonstration trials that if the farmer used atrazine, do not plant a variety of grain sorghum that does not have maize dwarf mosaic virus resistance. Why is that? Well. If we did that, we'd have the lowest yielding uh, grain sorghum in the trial. Okay, and I used to do trials all across Oklahoma and Texas, so I know how this works. Being a young agronomist, I didn't really care. I just wanted to make sure we had the top yielding variety. Okay, didn't understand what the science was behind it. Okay, so that's something to understand: is that you have to produce these produce these complete proteins to get those resistances. Then you produce fats, lipids, and oils. Okay. When you produce fats, lipids, and oils, that means that your plants are forming waxy layers on the leaf. You reach that level. You get resistance to downy mildew and powdery mildew at that point. Okay. Then, as they produce fats, lipids, and oils, then the plant is able to produce plant secondary metabolites. Okay. You get that, you get phytoalexins, terpenes, bioflavonoids. You get things that have pesticidal properties okay, at that time. You also get the ability to resist against cucumber beetles, Colorado potato beetles, and Japanese beetles. Okay? The reason that you get this up here is because the beetles can actually digest protein. So the only way the plant can protect itself is it has to be able to produce plant secondary metabolites. Uh, this is another good book to read. I'm not going to go into detail, but a pest starved on a healthy plant. Uh, that's it's by Francis Chabousseau that explains some of these things that I just uh, talked about. Uh, know that your plant has to be in protein synthesis mode. This is Dave Brandt in Ohio. Uh, he had an interesting trial in 2012. You see the species that are there. Uh, you 
see the 10-way mix, 8-species mix, 7-species mix, and then his agronomist told him to use 140 units of nitrogen to produce the amount of corn that he needed to have. So he, he put that out there, and he did a, a part in, with half that amount, and then he did it with no fertilizer. And here's the interesting thing, and I'm trying to tie this back to protein production in the plant. Where he had no fertilizer, he got the highest protein content. And if you notice, he also got the highest yield where he had those cover crops planted. Okay? So that's telling you that you're going to get higher protein content and yield production and all the things that we show you uh, that we're trying to attain. Okay? And just know that uh, higher protein content in his case means that he gets an extra $27 for every 100 uh, bushels of corn that he can sell to hog producers so they can finish their hogs out quicker. Uh, so that means a new pickup for him. Okay? Uh, tuning into nature. Insects are nature's garbage collectors. They communicate uh, with insects in the infrared spectrum. They can see differences in temperature, things like this. They are able to analyze that. Okay? And actually, me, we as humans, we only see in the visible light spectrum, but insects can see in the infrared. So they see slight differences in some of these. And that infrared is going to tell you just how nutrient dense a plant is. The plant is not very nutrient dense or it has a deficiency. It puts these other wavelengths out that insects can detect. They can tell. They know how they're being attracted to a to a particular plant, okay? What we have to do is we have to use bricks or a refractometer. And here's just an example. They've got some milkweed plants and they've got some monarch butterflies. Um, on bed number two, they have a 12 bricks reading, relatively low. On bed number one, they have an 18 bricks reading, much higher bricks reading. That means that it has more nutrients in it, more dense, more sugar, okay? So, in bed number two, you had a bricks of 12. The insects were going nuts over it. They were defoliating the whole plant. They're very, very active. On bed number one, that had the higher bricks rating, the larvae and stuff were very lethargic. They weren't moving around. They weren't really eating a whole lot. There weren't a very many butterflies on there depositing more larvae on the plant. It wasn't happening. Why? Because of the nutrient density. And that's just a picture there of the poo or the manure uh, that was coming out of that particular larvae, you see how it's a way darker color than the plant itself. It's telling you that it's, there's a concentration of nutrients there. And if, in the insect's case, it's not very healthy for the insect. Okay? That's why they were on the other uh, plant. Okay? So just understand, that's how plants uh, repel insects is by paying attention to that. Using a brick refractometer, some of the things that I've learned, poor calcium, you have a very sharp line when you look at that light and dark it means that you have poor calcium if you see a fuzzy line on it it means that you have good calcium level okay and then the last thing I want to talk about here is, is the plant sap pH meter you can use a plant sap pH meter when you start seeing low levels of brick to measure the plant sap pH okay and what we pay attention to is that the ideal pH of a plant is 6.4. If it goes below 6.4, what that's telling you within the plant cell, pH in the plant cell is controlled by anions and cations, negatively charged and positively charged types of the nutrients. When you go below 6.4, it's an indication that you're lacking calcium, magnesium, potassium, or maybe possibly sodium. Most of the time, it's calcium. Okay. When you lack calcium in the system, you don't get good cell integrity, so your probability of disease attack goes up. Okay. If the pH goes above 6.4, then what happens in that situation is you're lacking nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium. Okay. You're not producing true protein. So in that case right there, your percent of insect attack goes up. So those are some of the tools. I think, Jimmy, I've got a plant sap pH meter. I think that's one of the things we're going to start looking at. Okay? I think that'll help us understand if we're going in the right direction. And that's all we're trying to do with soil health. We're trying to build a dynamic equilibrium state. 
trying to build the amount of water soluble organic carbon that feeds the biology. We're trying to build aggregation and infiltration, water nutrient holding capacity, and productivity is going to come up in all, with all of that. Okay. So just use a little bit of uh, ingenuity and know that management affects soil function. And that's all I have to talk about. Be happy to talk to any of you about any of these processes and go into more and more detail. Thank you.